new report by the UN making clear how terrible the climate crisis actually is and how horrible it's gonna be for everyone, but especially for certain populations. Populations who have the least financial ability to actually withstand the effects of climate breakdown. This is coming from Philip Alson, a UN special reporter on extreme poverty, who previously had toured parts of America and described the extreme poverty that he found there. That's a fascinating report from I believe early last year, which you should definitely look for. Here on climate change, this is what he said. Climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of progress in development, global health and poverty reduction. It could push more than 120 million more people into poverty by 2030 and will have the most severe impact in poor countries, regions and the places poor people live and work. Perversely, while people in poverty are responsible for just a fraction of global emissions, they will bear the brunt of climate change and have the least capacity to protect themselves. We risk a climate apartheid scenario where the wealthy pay to escape overheating, hunger and conflict while the rest of the world is left to suffer. And so that is a, has an amazing turn of phrase there and very apt considering that Yes, it's you know we're the ones who are producing the uh, the emissions in the U.S. Places like now on the rise a bit in China and India, Europe, but it's going to be places in you know, like for the most part I would say Africa, but some parts of Asia as well that are going to be decimated by the effects of this, even though they were not the ones causing it in the first place. It's how power dynamics work. You know, the people in power that have the money that have the positions to do things about it. And if they, uh, they, when they decide not to because it doesn't benefit a couple dollars of theirs, uh, they're allowed to let these things slide. And then when someone actually wants to represent more than just those few people, they call them uh, the, um, fear mongering. They say you're making up these numbers. When AOC right. was talking about the Green New Deal and said the the I think it was a 12 year window when things yeah. will significantly Obvious, change. Yeah. Oh, now she's saying 12 years. Oh, look at this. How dare you say 12 years? Well, because you can look into the future somehow. Mm -hmm. you're, but you're, you're having your <laughs> uh, lack of acceptance of the facts based off of just because I said so. Mm -hmm. But when scientists and people who study the, the topic try to school you on it and you just back up and say, oh, can you believe that? That sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does sound crazy. Maybe you should pay attention since you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, it's. It, the, there, there's no incentive for the folks in power to do anything about people that aren't in power. There's devastating things that happen across the world already. But hey, we live in the United States of America and we say, oh, if I can't see it, it doesn't really happen. Oh, then we say there's devastating parts of the United States of America that look like a war zone. Oh, well, I don't live there. It doesn't really happen. And it, it's the, those areas get larger and larger. And in the areas where they can put themselves in, in, over a wall and drop down a moat, yeah. And drop a bridge over moat to let only the certain few people in. That becomes the reality. But until it becomes that point, no one will believe it. Yeah, that just that first graphic there that it threatens to undo the last fifty years of progress. Just putting all of that in perspective. And you're talking about numbers, and we always talk. We talk about that twelve year number and what the irreparable damage that will have occurred at that mark. And then also at that point, you know, going back fifty years. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. The thing, and by the way, we're we're at eleven years now because that number's from last year. Oh, uh, and it depends on who you talk to. But the thing is, if you think that it's crazy, like oh my god, we only have twelve years. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are any climate deniers or anyone who's just hearing about this now, I know most of you have been paying attention to this topic. You know that people didn't just start talking about this in October <laughs> of last year. Right. Yeah. People have been sounding warnings for decades and decades, and nobody listened. Barely anyone is listening now. And if it sounds like what we need to do now to avert not the consequences of climate breakdown, that ship has sailed, but the worst consequences, the apocalyptic visions of what the future could be, that's because we chose not to act when moderate or even light changes to our behaviors and electricity generation and transportation would have been enough to solve the problem. We didn't listen in the 70s, the 80s and the 90s. And so now, yeah, things have gotten a little bit extreme. And so our solutions have to be extreme as well. The actual issues are fascinating. I wanna give you a little bit more from this because what this is going to cause, the climate apartheid that he's talking about is not just overall heating. It actually impacts the function of governments as well. With this section saying, the rights to life, food, housing and water will be dramatically affected. But equally importantly will be the impact on democracy as governments struggle to cope with the consequences and to persuade their people to accept the major social and economic transformations required. In such a setting, civil and political rights will be highly vulnerable. Now there, they might well be talking about some states, for instance, in Asia and Africa that are gonna be, as we pointed out, more affected by these sorts of changes. So when you have a country where uh, 
their ability to produce crops uh, dries up. Their literal water sources literally dry up. Mm -hmm. We were talking about um, there's glaciers, I think near Nepal, that provide drinking water for a billion people. That's a significant chunk of the entire human population that is rapidly receding right now. You cannot remove drinking water for a billion people without expecting mass chaos. And perhaps we can build our walls high enough, perhaps we have enough guns to avert all of those problems. But we do live in an interconnected society. We cannot simply wall off America from the rest of the world and imagine that as we create a smoldering hell outside of our borders, that that's not gonna come home to roost inside of them as well. It's building right now, as you just said, building a wall along our, wall along our borders to keep the undesirables out. We're already there. So these, <laughs> these, these doubters about the reality are some of the supporters for that same reality. You're building a wall to keep those other people out because they're leaving instances and, and, and countries that are in such turmoil because of things that we've done to push dis, <laughs> distrust around the world. Now there a lot of people are fleeing to other places already. And it's not like it's anything new either, as you said. This is, this is something that's gone on so long. Uh, Mike Pompeo was talking about the, uh, the rising waters before. His reason for saying that's a good thing was, A, that's good for uh, our waterways. That's a, that's a good way to travel and, and have trade come through. And that was accepted as an answer. For some reason, that, does, that isn't met with, how dare you? I don't do anything on the waterways. Why isn't it taken personally then? It's only taken personally when it comes to the rich and powerful saying, uh, that doesn't affect me, move along now. And we're supposed to accept that. And the fact that you, we all keep talking about walls and uh, the people here in this country, a lot of the lawmakers in charge don't seem to care. It's not even that they don't even believe it. I, they don't seem to care. No, they no. keep talking about needing more research or oh, it doesn't have to be this. We can have a moderate plan, we can do this. And these walls, this is one thing that um, is America's not gonna be exempt from. Mm -hmm. you know. And of course, we already have pockets of people that you one could say our lawmakers already consider undesirables, people that don't deserve protection and uh, help. Yeah, it's well, that's, why we, that's why we're building up the military too. The military makes sure that we have, if not the physical wall, then the wall of intimidation and death. Yeah, You cross this line, we will kill you. We're saying all these things right now. Mm -hmm. So 2019, we're pointing out how we're saying it. Literally the chant of your president was build that wall. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, we have an obligation to talk about what is gonna happen in the future, but don't let that lull you in a false sense that the consequences are coming. We're dwelling in the consequences right now. California hasn't been on fire for the last few years because someday climate change is going to be an issue. The right. hurricanes that have destroyed portions of the US, the flooding in the Midwest, these aren't hypotheticals in the 2030s or 40s or 50s. They are the reality we're living with right now, and they are wreaking a horrible, a toll, not not just in terms of you know the, the people that have died in the cases of these extreme weather events, but the economic toll as well has been significant. And uh, we we get into this habit of asking, how are you going to pay for certain things, certain things, not other things? Like, how are you going to pay for the horrific economic cost of climate breakdown as it continues? I want to read. I know we're just going to be a little bit over. I want to read two more quotes because they're amazing. I'm actually considering doing a special event where I sit down and read the entire UN event on a live stream, just because it's so important and literally no one is paying attention to it. But here's two more quotes from Philip Allison, who says, "States have marched past every scientific warning and threshold, and what was once considered catastrophic warming now seems like a best case scenario. Even today, too many countries are taking short-sighted steps in the wrong direction." And he goes on to say, maintaining the current course is a recipe for economic catastrophe. Economic prosperity and environmental sustainability are fully compatible, but require decoupling economic well-being and poverty reduction from fossil fuel emissions. And so there are responsible people in the UN, scientists, some politicians who are taking this threat seriously. But unfortunately, right now, they don't sit in the White House. They don't hold the levers of power. We need to put responsible people who understand and accept science in a position to do what is necessary to stop the worst effects that are being sketched out in reports like this. And I just pray to God that that does happen in this next election. Like what you see, click the subscribe button below and don't forget to ring the bell to never miss another video from the Young Turks.